I'm going to provide a, uh, a, a very quick overview and try and provide above all some of the, the concept and structure of the analysis that's been, been done in the Infrastructure Transitions Research Consortium um, and report on, on the models and the evidence base that we've developed. Uh, after the break, you're going to get um, slightly more in-depth reports from a number of the different technical teams who've been working on this. So you'll get a bit more depth and then after lunch there'll be an opportunity to go into even more depth in the, in the discussions um, around the computers and, and workstations. Um, and as I emphasized from the start, these, these, these are pilot results. It's a limited number of scenarios and options that we've looked at and, and we're here to above all to demonstrate capability, though um, hopefully there will be some substantive insights from, from what we've been able to do so far as well. First of all, uh, uh, an introduction to who we are, uh, the Infrastructure Transitions Research Consortium. This is a, uh, a government-funded research program, so funded um, by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, which now forms part of uh, UK Research and Innovation. Um, and actually, uh, we've been funded since uh, 2011 and have had two phases of funding from um, EPSRC. Uh, and we're a consortium of, of, of seven universities who are, are listed there. The first phase of ITRC uh, was responding to the, the um, emerging and what then became very strong need um, to build capability to analyze national infrastructure um, and in particular to look at the interdependencies between national infrastructure sectors, so between energy, transport, digital, water, waste. Um, and so within the first phase of ITRC, we developed the uh, NISMOD model, the National Infrastructure Systems model, which provided a capability and, and genuinely unique capability, actually, to look at uh, across infrastructure sectors at the national scale. And uh, this was very much within a, a scenario analysis framework. So we used um, scenarios of population, economic growth, climate change, um, and then looked at what are the options for infrastructure provision, um, both in terms of investments in new assets, but also looking at um, policy and regulatory interventions um, in infrastructure provision. And uh, we uh, built NISMOD by the end of the, the, the first phase of ITRC. Um, it's reported um, in this book here. And as I mentioned, this happened at a time when um, infrastructure was going very rapidly up the national agenda, first with the creation of um, Infrastructure UK within the Treasury, um, and then the National Infrastructure Commission, which had the responsibility to deliver the UK's first national infrastructure assessment, um, which we worked closely with them on, on several aspects of that assessment, and, and NISMOD was, was used as part of that. The other flip side to NISMOD has been um, alongside this question of what should the plan be, and how would a a national infrastructure plan perform under a range of different scenarios was, well, what are, what are the risks um, and how resilient um, is national infrastructure um, to what we observe as an increasing frequency, um, in particular of climate-related hazards. Um, and so we developed actually much higher resolution analysis of national infrastructure networks, um, energy, transport, uh, water, and um, use those to uh, analyze the resilience of, uh, of national infrastructure to pinpoint points of vulnerability and to inform investments in order to enhance resilience. That's been uh, very useful to the Environment Agency in their long-term investment scenarios where we 
provided evidence for the agency in terms of the vulnerability of national infrastructure, and that helped to, to build the, the business case um, for uh, further investment um, in, in uh, flood protection. And we're currently working uh, with the National Infrastructure Commission on the resilience study that the Commission is, is doing this year. Those of you who, who looked at the National Infrastructure Assessment will, will recognize that though it, it, it referred to resilience, um, there wasn't actually any analysis in there. There was a lot to do in the first NIA, um, and the Commission deliberately put resilience to one side. Um, since then, the Chancellor of the Exchequer asked the Commission to, to look more carefully at resilience, um, and so that is, is, is what we're working with the Commission on now. Um, very interestingly, um, looking to the future to see some of the implications of changes we're seeing within infrastructure, um, so in particular electrification, um, and bringing in the uh, digital dimension, so looking at the resilience of, uh, of fixed um, and mobile digital networks as well, and that's, that's ongoing work. And then the, the final aspect of, uh, of, of ITRC, which I should refer to before I, I, I move on to the ARC, is um, the subsequent investment, um, about, again, by EPSRC on behalf of UKRI in DAFNI, the Data and Analytics Facility for National Infrastructure, which is part of the UK Collaboratorium for Re Research on Infrastructure and Cities, UCRIC. Um, so this provides the hardware and software platform where um, everything I've just mentioned and also everything I'm just about to talk about um, is, is in the process of being migrated. Daphne is located, um, very interestingly for the, for the ARC, um, at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in Harwell. So, uh, depending on, on where you stop, maybe you go all the way to Swindon, um, or maybe you get as far as Harwell um, as being a, uh, a, another real knowledge pole in this uh, west to east arc. So, um, on to the arc. And I said the, the first phase of the ITRC program um, developed NISMOD, this National Infrastructure um, Analysis Model. Um, and then in the second phase of ITRC, um, you'll have seen this, uh, this term Mistral, you might have even wondered what it meant. Um, Mistral means um, multi-scale infrastructure systems analytics, so our, our commitment within the Mistral program was to go from the national perspective to look at a range of different scales. And specifically, um, the, the national scale um, you've then got two directions you can go in, and we went in both directions. So one is going upscale. So within the Mistral program, we've done a, a lot of very interesting and what has become quite influential work in terms of global infrastructure networks, the resilience of those networks, the ways in which those networks are gonna change in future. Um, and then downscale, to re because we recognize that um, so much of the innovation which is taking place within infrastructure is taking place at quite local scales um, in terms of digitization, electrification, local heat networks, automation of vehicles, and so on and so on. So um, within the Mistral program, we've um, uh, increased the resolution of NISMOD to a very great extent, and that's what, what you're going to, to see in a moment to enable us to uh, address some, but not all, of these, uh, these local infrastructure issues. I should also, on, on that list of local dimensions, I should also um, refer to surface water flooding and urban drainage as being an extremely important local process which we weren't able to, uh, to resolve within the, uh, the national NISMOD model. So we committed in principle, and actually when we wrote the Mistral proposal, um, we hadn't actually decided where we were going to apply it, um, but we had decided that we would, would develop this downscale capability. So then, um, well, why the ARC? And we settled on the ARC um, at, at our assembly about a year and a half ago. Um, 
One is um, that it's on the doorstep of two of the universities in our consortium, Oxford and Cambridge, though I think I was coming from Oxford myself rather self-conscious of the doorsteps of um, uh, several other universities in our, in our consortium. Um, I think one version of this is that this is a starting point and there are, um, uh, there are similar strategic regional infrastructure issues um, surfacing in, in other parts of the country and this is a transferable capability which, which could be used in those other places. Um, we looked at the, the, the Northern Powerhouse um, and had a series of meetings around that but um, I think concluded that it was it's probably a bit too big. Um, it's, and it, its geography is, is problematic in terms of where, what the logic of drawing the line is. And it's very much a transport related notion at the moment. Um, whereas um, in this original piece of work by the National Infrastructure Commission on the ARC, um, they were deliberately, and not surprising for the NIC, um, right from the start were emphasizing the importance of looking in an integrated way across infrastructure sectors and housing. And that very much played to our strengths in terms of the capabilities that we have to look in an integrated way across different infrastructure systems. Uh, the other attraction of the ARC is that it, 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 it's live. It's very current. Um, and as we heard from Bev, there's, there's still a lot of decision making to be made. So we're in a, in a position where some pieces are beginning to fit into place, but there's, there's still a, gr a great deal to play for. And so that, I think, work, works very well in terms of us wanting to do something constructive in relation to a, a, a live set of decisions. And um, the, the, the final point is that, um, uh, as again, we, 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 we've already heard from Bev, um, and we all know that there's a, there are so many stakeholders in, in the ARC. There are uh, three LEPs, 30 odd um, uh, local authorities, and so on and so on. Um, and so the, I think there's a, there's a clear need um, for a, 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 a spatial analysis, analysis capability, which can, has been constructed in an, in an open way, in the way we have done, um, and that many of these different stakeholders and actors can potentially congregate around, scrutinize what's in there, as you will be doing today, and hopefully provide a, a, a common and a shared platform for geospatial analysis, geodesign one might say, um, which people can negotiate around, talk about, um, and understand what is agreed upon, have a common um, basis of, of, of facts in terms of what's there at the moment and the way in which it functions, um, which will then help some focus on, on the areas where there the does need to be di discussion and, and agreement. So, uh, I'll, the, the logic of our approach um, is summarized in, in this picture, um, and there's, there's a bunch of jargon in there, uh, but hopefully by the end of the day you'll have understand, understood what um, some of these words mean. Um, but the, the approach is one of um, scenario analysis, um, where we're looking at a, a range of possible futures, in particular in the ARC, those futures are around where population, employment, and houses are gonna be. So that's in, a, in our scenario space. Um, and then we're looking at um, going from that to understand, well, for given scenarios, um, what does that mean in terms of needs and demand for infrastructure services? We're, we're focused on, on, on infrastructure within our work. Um, what are the options for delivery of that, uh, of those services? And how those options might be um, put together into what you might think of as, as, as being a strategy, taking into account um, interdependencies between those different uh, infrastructure sectors. 
Um, the scenario part of this actually is, is much more complex than the scenario analysis that we did um, for, at, at, at a national scale. At a national scale, we, we had demographic and economic scenarios. We actually looked um, at, uh, nationally at scenarios for, for the way in which population might develop um, regionally. So we did quite a bit of downscaling. Um, but actually, when you come to a, uh, a, a, a context like the ARC, um, the, one needs to think much more carefully at this much more detailed spatial scale around questions of where might the employment be, um, what amount of um, in-migration might you get from other parts of the country, and that's one of the things um, we've, uh, we've worked on. And then given the projections for, for population growth, what are the variants for where that population might go? And then given that, um, where might the, uh, the, the housing go? And of course, there's circularity to that question um, in terms of the relationship between employment, population, and housing. And it's taken us quite a long time to, to, to get our heads around that, um, but we have some, some tools. Um, this population um, projection tool called uh, SIMIN from the University of Leeds. Uh, uh, UDM, an urban development model, um, developed in, uh, in Newcastle, um, which is helping us to develop these, uh, these spatial scenarios, which you'll see in a moment. Um, the housing um, scenarios, and we are in scenario space, so here I'm just declaring the, uh, the, the scenarios that we're looking at. Um, a baseline which um, is a, uh, basically a, a long-running um, average of what's been, been seen um, over the last couple of decades in the arc. Then we look at um, two scenarios for uh, expansion and new settlements. And those actually, we, those are two different scenarios. One is looking at urban expansion around the existing urban centers, and I'll show some of that in a moment. Another is looking at a scenario of new settlements. Um, but for both of those, um, we then have uh, different rates of, uh, of, of new dwellings per year, which is what you can see there, 23,000 or 30,000. And then alongside that, we wanted to look at what's, what's referred to here as, as unplanned. So given the drivers which uh, Bev has, has referred to, um, the employment and, and demographic drivers, what happens if basically we just see a version of the types of development which we're, we're seeing um, in, in the region at the moment, um, which I'm generalizing, but I've, if I look in, in Oxfordshire, um, I'm seeing um, low density um, housing developments popping up all over the countryside, um, many of them near Didcot, um, but many of them in, in, in other parts of the county as well, and perhaps I echo Richard Harding's remark here, I struggle to work out um, what's going on there, um, uh, uh, why it's happening and what the plan is. Um, and so we wanted to, uh, to, to look at a version of that as well. So that, was, that just summarizes our, our scenario space. Then um, uh, the arc is, um, of course, uh, interesting, and we've touched on this already from a, from a transportation perspective. In the previous ITRC work, um, we've been at a national scale looking at what are the big policy options, what are the big investments um, which government might consider with respect to infrastructure, transport infrastructure provision. Um, in the ARC, of course, we know that um, two big transport infrastructure investments are uh, are on the drawing board, um, uh, the expressway and east-west rail. So we have taken those within the structure of our scenarios, saying that um, we've um, given that the, the routes and the station locations um, have not been decided upon or announced. Um, we've made some assumptions there 
um, in terms of the, the routes and the station locations. Um, these are just assumptions, and we could repeat this analysis um, with any number of different um, strategic transport infrastructure assumptions. The uh, attraction of our model, which, which Simon Blaney will talk about in a moment, um, is that it is um, very flexible um, and is able to look at, at a whole range of different um, possible transport infrastructure investments. Um, the, and so this summarizes then um, where we've assumed the uh, stations would be in east-west rail. Um, and then we've taken that as being the main determinant of um, where the, uh, the, the new employment um, in, uh, with, beyond the expansion of the existing centers, which we indicated there, might take place. So that's um, been one of, an, another main part of our, uh, the way in which we've structured the scenarios, is to, uh, to make some assumptions. Now again, there are many other versions of where the employment um, might be concentrated. But this is, is what we've used for, for this stage in, in our analysis, and we could, could certainly look at others. Um, there are then many different um, attractors or constraints in terms of exactly where the housing might be located. Here I'm, I'm showing one of the several layers that have, have been, um, we've been using um, in order to look at the attractiveness and constraints. Um, uh, this comes from, from work that Alison Smith has done, done in, in Oxford, and these are the locations, if we're looking at ecosystem services, where there is most value to be had from interactions with nature. Um, and so if we're, uh, we wish to preserve these places, then we can use those as overlays of constraints within our spatial mapping um, to see where development um, might be located. And here are two versions of that. This comes from the UDM model, which Ali Ford will say a little bit more about in a moment. Um, and uh, you may not be able to see, but the first a set of panels is, and you can look in the, the executive summary you've got in front of you if, if you can't see the screen very well. The upper set of panels is um, for the expansion of the existing urban areas development scenario. The lower set of panels is for the, for the new developments. And the left-hand set then, given that those are the ways in which, um, in this scenario, we expect to see development taking place. What is the suitability of land um, for new housing? Um, and so, in the expansion scenario, you can see quite a diffuse map of su suitability, but basically it's, it's the, the, the strongest attractors around the existing urban areas. For the new settlement scenario, you can see those, those hot spots of, of suitability in those places which have been um, set out for, for new settlements. That then um, uh, leads us to effectively allocate the development, which is what happens in the central panel. So that's where the yellow areas are, um, is where um, most of the future development is taking place. And then in the right-hand panel, that's a, a consequential map of density, so uh, effectively a map of, of where we expect the, uh, the urban density to be located in future. Just go, dipping one um, layer lower than that, and this is work in progress. Um, uh, Nahid Majiri has a poster out which she'll be able to talk a bit more about this work where we've begun to, to look using some um, machine learning algorithms, and we're doing more work via the Alan Turing Institute on this over the coming months, um, to characterize the existing built-up areas, so the, na the precise nature of the, the buildings, the gaps between them, the brownfield sites, um, to begin to think through how much, uh, how many additional dwellings might go into the existing built-up areas given different um, 
uh, scenarios, planning regulations um, with respect to densification. Um, so now I'm just going to skip through very quickly to provide an overview of the uh, of what that then means in terms of the, the other infrastructure sectors we looked at, um, energy, digital, water, urban drainage. Um, energy, we've, uh, the, the headline answer is that um, we, it is possible to achieve the goal of carbon neutrality for the arc. And in fact, there are, there are many ways of doing it. We looked at, um, four different, um, uh, different strategies here. The first basically focused on electrification, one which pays a lot more attention to heat networks. Heating is the biggest challenge with respect to decarbonization of, of dwellings um, because the amount of heating that, uh, that, that comes from gas at the moment. There's a green gas version of that, so we could stick with the gas network um, but uh, put renewable gas into it, and then there's a, a, a set of options where a, a number of different things have been put together. Madassa um, will we'll say a little bit more about this at the moment. Um, and we've looked very carefully at um, of how much energy could be um, generated locally. Um, it depends on the scenario, but up to 70% um, of the electricity needs could be generated um, within the arc. And that includes the fact that within our transport scenarios, and I didn't mention this at the time, we've looked carefully at um, electrification of transport um, and the fact that in future uh, about 25% of energy demand um, could be a consequence of, uh, uh, could be needed for electric vehicles. Um, they're also recognizing that if you have um, vehicle to grid, charging um, those electric vehicles can, can provide us um, with storage to go alongside the intermittent renewable supplies. Um, the uh, digital networks for the ARC are a, a, a huge opportunity if we think about them um, carefully now. Unlike the other infrastructure services, actually the, the increasing demand for digital um, uh, that's the, the top panel. Uh, the, uh, a population change, even a, a million new homes, um, hardly features in the way in which digital demand is going to change in future because the main driver of demand is the, uh, the, the uptake of, of new technologies, in particular um, the pro prolific use of, um, uh, of video um, and other streaming services. So those are the, the demand scenarios we're looking at. Ed Orton in Cambridge, who you're going to hear from, um, has uh, used a very sophisticated model of 5G um, rollout for the ARC to work out how 5G um, mobile can be built into the ARC, and uh, has also looked at the cost of um, uh, ubiquitous fiber to the premises, um, which has become a political issue in this election, as we, we know. Um, and has, has calculated um, that that um, for the arc could be um, between 1.6 and, and 2.3 um, billion, um, but recognizing the importance of making the right decisions from, from the outset to uh, will we'll bring that um, cost and keep it, it, it manageable. Finally, um, with respect to water, we've used a, um, National Water Resource System model, a model called Watnet, which was originally developed um, with uh, Water UK and, and Atkins um, and is now uh, run within my group in Oxford and has been extended to cover all of England and Wales. So we can look um, strategically at the relationship between the arc and water supply and demand in the rest of the country, in particular what's going on in, in London. We looked at um, three large water resource zones, so that's better, and um, you might not recognize, unless you're a water resources engineer, um, what these zones mean to, but just take it that um, the, the top one is the, the, the west, so that's Swindon and Oxfordshire. 
Um, the middle one is the middle, and the lower one is the east, so that's over um, uh, towards Cambridge. And what we've looked at um, is what's going to happen with demand, but then in the left set of panels, how much might be achieved um, with demand management and leakage reduction, and then Given that, how much more would you need to do in terms of investing in um, additional supply side infrastructure? And basically on this heat map, um, red is bad. That's where we don't want to be um, because these are water shortages at a, um, a, a level and severity um, which, um, uh, depending on how you define that, would um, probably be unacceptable. Um, what we demonstrate is how much can be done with demand management and leakage reduction. We know that already from the water company's own water resource management plans. Um, but then how, if um, we do need to do things on the supply side, how some of the major infrastructure investments being considered by the water companies um, would uh, reduce that risk of sh water shortage to a, uh, to a tolerable level. And basically, this picture, which again is, is, is in the report, um, not surprisingly, shows the, how the infrastructure investments um, being considered by Thames Water um, make things better in the, um, the west, in Swindon and Oxfordshire, how some of the things being considered by um, Anglian Water and Affinity Water um, could address the issues uh, in, in the east. Um, so what have we learnt from all of this? Um, the, uh, there are a lot of choices still to be made, and um, I, mean, I spoke to a couple of radio stations in Oxfordshire yesterday and was emphasising how much rests on those choices. So it's the question of, of how we go about doing the arc, um, which is really crucial now. And there the, the are choices um, which are <clears throat> really significant in terms of the, the sustainability of uh, what is being planned for the future. In relation to the, um, to the infrastructure sectors that we've looked at, so energy, transport, digital, water, there's more work on, on urban drainage, which will be reported um, outside. These can be done sustainably, but not surprisingly, um, it's much easier and more cost effective and more effective in general if these things are, are, are thought of um, properly right from the outset. And we think also about the interdependencies, for example, between electrification of transport and the, uh, the electricity supply system. Uh, that's, I suppose, the, the good news. Um, not surprisingly at all to anyone in this room, space is the issue. Um, it, the question, the precise questions of exactly where you do things and where and how new housing is, is developed. Um, and uh, so that, I think... Um, kind of points to the need to, to, to take this work forwards to, as, as Bev has said, to develop a, a spatial strategy because space is, is, is where um, the, 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 the crunch happens between the, the various needs and values that, that we project for the ARC. I'll emphasize again, this is, uh, is a pilot. It's a demonstration of capability. We're still researching. Um, so uh, there's ongoing work which I mentioned on, on drainage, on natural capital mapping, um, on densification um, jointly with the Alan Turing Institute. Um, and we're very ready and the purpose of this meeting is to, to reach out to um, the, the many stakeholders within the ARC um, because we're very ready to um, look at more scenarios and, and more options. Um, going forwards. You're gonna, we're going to break now and have a cup of coffee. Um, and uh, then 
After the break, you're going to see more, and there'll be an opportunity to ask some questions, both of me and of the, the, the various specialists who've, who've actually done this work. Um, and as I say this afternoon, there'll be the opportunity for a lot more detailed face-to-face -face interactions. But before we do um, break, I'd um, like to take the opportunity to, to, to thank um, the ITRC team, so to, to thank all of the researchers who've done a, a huge amount of work to get us to this point. We, some, we kind of set ourselves these unrealistic targets of um, analyzing something hugely controversial and that ambitious and multidimensional, um, which is a kind of, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm the director of this thing, I see it as a good discipline, um, that dis in, because we have to deliver something um, on time and have something to, to give to you in an event like this. But um, actually doing that does entail a huge amount of work, which I, I, I recognize and appreciate. And people working in universities have many different demands upon their time. And the whole team has really pulled its finger out in order to, to get us to, to where we are now and to this real milestone on the, on the ITRC um, journey. Um, particularly grateful to Adrian Hickford, who um, wrote and coordinated uh, this uh, executive summary that you've got here and got it to the printers on time. Um, and as ever to Miriam for um, coordinating all of us and, and keeping us on track. So thank you all and let's have a cup of coffee.